think you're a truthful person. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm David Morrison, Executive Director of Historic Harrisburg. It's great to see uh, a lot of you whom I haven't seen for a couple of years. Others I've seen more recently, but this is really the first large audience that we've had here in, uh, in almost three years. So it's great to have you back. It's also going to be broadcast live uh, on historicharrisburg.org for people that uh, uh, are at home watching. Uh, and we, we think we're going to continue to do our programs in a blended format. But we really love it when we have a live audience. Uh, I certainly appreciate it. And you get to get some refreshments and see the exhibit out there, ask questions. And also, if you're a member of Historic Harrisburg, you get to vote in our annual meeting, which is going to start in just a minute. It's the shortest annual meeting of any organization I know of. But we, we have to do it uh, to, to abide by our bylaws. Uh, so with that, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, turn the, the uh, podium over to our board president, Tom Dar, to open the annual meeting and conduct that business. Tom? Thank you, and good evening to you all. It is so nice to see so many faces that I've known in the past and uh, haven't seen for several years. It seems very strange, but very nice. Uh, we're thrilled to have this uh, sort of continuation of the commemoration of Agnes. Many of you, I think, I guess were here then, and uh, I was telling Eileen Young, she asked if I would, or no, it wasn't you, it was, it was someone else in the room. Was I here? And, for Agnes, and the answer was no, I was 16, and I lived in Indiana, Pennsylvania, and our basement flooded as well, not to the extent here, and my father, we had no sump pump, so my father went down with a coal shovel and shoveled water continually coming in for hours into the wash sink inside the, the, the uh, huh. thing. He went on and on and on. I went down once and said, you want me to help you? He said, no. So I retreated back upstairs. I never felt so badly in my life to be a son and uh, not being able to help. But uh, be that as it may, thanks for coming. And let's uh, move on to the annual meeting, if we may. I'm going to ask Devin Drabick to come up. She's the immediate past president. Uh, we have three things on the agenda tonight. And one of them is electing a new class of board members, which is contained, I think, mostly of existing board members. Secondly, electing <coughs> officers, a slate of officers. And third, there are I, one or two amendments, David? One. one. Just one. All right, all right. We'll talk, let's talk about two. An amendment to the bylaws, which relates to our having changed the fiscal year from <laughs> calendar to fiscal year. June. So, with that, let me turn it over to Devin for a little bit of the action. The action. The action. I love that description. The action. <laughs> we'll keep the action short so you can get to the presentation. I'm short. All right. It's my honor to present the candidates for the board of directors um, for their next three-year term, which will end in June 2025. You should have a copy of this, but I'll go over the names really quickly. <coughs> David Bronstein, Tom Dar, Shane Gallagher, Jonathan Hendrickson, Chrissy Kelly, Linda Plessick, Chuck Smith, and Sarah Sweeney. I'd like to move to adopt the candidates for the board of directors as slated. And is there a second? Yeah. <coughs> May I see a show of hands in favor? <laughs> I see. I thought you were going to make it interesting. Uh, I see several of fans opposed. Oh, okay. You can't do it both. <laughs> what if you're not a member? If you're not a member, then I hope you didn't vote. But no, did. I did not. <laughs> uh, the eyes have it. Seven. Sounds great. All right. Next, I would like to present the candidates for officers of the board. These are just one-year terms, so they will end in June 2023. 
President Tom Darr, First Vice President Shane Gallagher, Vice President Linda Plessick, and Vice President Dan Fulton, Secretary and Council Jay Queen, Treasurer will be Miriam DeFour, and I'll stay on as immediate past president as long as Tom's here. I'd like to move to adopt the candidates for the officers of the board. Is there a second for Devin's motion? Eileen. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Thank you. The ayes have it. Number right. three. Um, I want to present the amendment to the HHA bylaws. The recommendation is to change um, Article 2, which lists the fiscal year starting January 1st. We want to move that to July 1st, which will make bookkeeping and so many other things this year. <laughs> Um, this was approved by the HHA board on April 5th, so we'll bring it to the membership now. And I just add that one of the things that makes it better is that we, as you all know, have a lot of stuff that takes <laughs> place at the end of the calendar year. The house tour, hopefully, uh, elegant progressions, a lot of things. And frankly, David is pressed to the death uh, trying to correlate all that kind of stuff, as well as doing administrative things like working with our accountants and our auditors. So uh, we think it's a better move. Is there a move? Did you move? I move to adopt the amendment. Is there a second? Bob Young? Is there any discussion? <laughs> any questions? Those in favor, signify by raising your hand. Thank you. Those opposed, the same. Motion carries. Thank you very much. We'll record those. And David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Tom and Devin. Uh, and, and thank you for everybody for approving that amendment, which means I can now spend the Christmas holidays enjoying the holidays instead of closing out the business year of Historic Harrisburg Association, so I'm very grateful for that. Uh, our program tonight uh, is a, a very special program, and it concludes a month of activities uh, pertaining to the 50th anniversary uh, of the, the Agnes Flood of 1972. And the, the small program that, uh, that we handed out that you have, we've been handing that out at activities throughout the month, that started uh, earlier in June. We had a special program in Shipoke where we unveiled the newest of one of our outdoor history exhibits. There are the, the outdoor exhibits that look like this one here. You can, I'm sure you've seen them, but it's right down in Shipoke uh, commemorating not only the flood, but it's called a celebration of resolve. And that really is part of the theme of the entire month is that we're not just focused on how deep was the water and how many gallons per minute and all this kind of stuff, but really what, what was the result? What was the aftermath? How did Harrisburg recover? The extraordinary recovery is really what we're, we're talking about uh, in the years and decades that followed the flood uh, and, and some of the great things that happened. So I guess with that, Ashley, we're about to get started. Can everybody see okay or should we turn out that, that other light there? Can you reach that? You see the one that's, that would be great. Thank you. I think that's better. Good. So, uh, a celebration of rough resolve, 50 years after Agnes, Harrisburg's extraordinary recovery from the Agnes flood uh, of, of 1972. Next slide. And these are some of the sponsors and people who provided some of the historic photographs. Uh, which you can see. And this is also what you'll see in the exhibit out in the banking hall. And you can linger after the program and look at the exhibit if you haven't had a chance to look at it uh, already. Uh, i got to give credit to Jeb Stewart, uh, of our longstanding member uh, and volunteer for Historic Harrisburg, who put together this program initially. Uh, and he was going to present it tonight, but he's got out-of-town relatives visiting from North Carolina, and he really felt that he had to, to stay at home and, and uh, entertain them. So he turned this this uh, particular assignment over to me. Next slide. High water. Okay, the first uh, uh, part of our story tells about the actual flood. Now this is probably the most famous of all the, all the flood pictures. That's the governor's residence uh, and the surrounding neighborhood 
uh, uh, it's completely inundated by water. And the governor's residence, the water came up to uh, three or four feet above the first floor, uh, right about to the piano keys, as I recall, on the grand piano. Uh, it did a lot of damage. Uh, it took a couple of years to get the, the residents back in business again. Governor Schaap never did move back in, uh, but uh, it, it was fully restored and, and it's, it's good as new now. But the, these neighborhoods surrounding, let's see if, I, yeah, that, that's uh, Second Street, the row of houses. They're all in good shape now. Over Patty Corner from the governor's residence, just north of McClay, an entire block of houses burned to the ground. Uh, there was an electrical fire there. The fire department couldn't get in to do anything about it, and the houses burned. And when you travel up Second Street now, you'll see some of what we call the post-flood architecture. Those are the houses that have the open garages and, and nothing more than a vestibule leading to the second floor, and all of the living uh, 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 part of the house is on the second and third floor. A lot of those houses in Shypoke, but you'll also see them in Midtown and Uptown as well. Anywhere that was affected by the flood sufficiently enough is required to build that way. You'll also see office buildings on Front Street that have the same general arrangement where the, the first floor, the ground level I'll call it, not the first floor, is, is open parking and the only thing that, that comes down to the ground level is perhaps a staircase or an elevator tower and then all of the, the function of the building begins on the second floor. Next slide. Oh, and, and here you're going to see, let's go back, Ashley. Uh, we're, we're trying to sh kind of show then and now with all of these pictures. So this shows the governor's residence as it appears today. Next slide. Can I ask, did the piano survive? <laughs> Question. Okay. <laughs> yes. Just checking. David? Oh, great. Well, glad to hear that. Yeah, great. Me too. <laughs> uh, now, North. Uh, Front Street and Second Street at Verbeck Street. Now this is Verbeck that goes right up to the Broad Street Market. We're right on Verbeck at Third and Verbeck, just just out of the picture there. Uh, let's see that. Yeah, in fact, we might even be in the picture because there's the church behind us. So Historic Harrisburg and the bank building is right in here. There's the Broad Street Market. This is this row of houses with the front porches uh, uh, in the 1200 block of, of Second Street. They're still there. Everything has changed quite a bit here since the flood. There were two gas stations either side of Burbeck Street or Front and Burbeck. They're no longer there. The location of that gas station is still there as an open lot uh, owned by Vartan. But uh, here is where the uh, Laurel Terrace uh, high-rise senior citizen housing was built uh, on that uh, particular block. And you can see that the Susquehanna River really came up beyond Second Street uh, in, in much of the city. And here it is today. There's the Laurel Tower high rise at uh, the open lot where the other gas station was. Sunken Garden is right in front. So here would be Sunken Garden completely inundated. So it recovered as well. Let's go to the next slide. What is the street to the right of Burbank? What, what was that? What is the street to the right of Burbank? The street to the right of Burbank uh, up here would be Calder, would be the next street to the north. Oh, to the right. Uh, Cumberland. Would that okay. be Cumberland, everybody? Yes. Yeah, I think so. There's a couple of alleys in there, but I think that's Cumberland. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now this shows some of the depth of the water. This is up in the 2100 block of Green Street. Uh, row houses and, and twin houses uh, where people really had to be rescued by, by firemen uh, with ropes uh, to get them out of their houses. And here are the houses recovered today. Uh, they're twin houses, nice twin houses uh, in uh, uptown, uh, just north of, of McClay Street. So just north of that McClay Street area where the governor's mansion is, is one of the low-lying areas. When you drive up 2nd Street or down Front Street, you're not really conscious of the fact that you're rising and falling in elevation, but you are. And so it, it takes a flood to tell you where the low levels are. Uh, I happen to live in Midtown uh, uh, near Bow Street, and uh, we tend to call that Mount Midtown because it doesn't get flooded. Okay, next slide. And feel free to ask questions anytime or offer comments. I'm happy to have you do that. This is the Paxson Creek looking south from the State Street Bridge. Uh, and the industrial corridor of Harrisburg that goes along a, a parallel to uh, uh, Cameron Street and parallel to the train tracks is a very low-lying area. So it was extensively flooded. Uh, in this flood and, and in the other major floods, uh, 
flooded, flooded this particular industrial corridor. And the Paxton Creek is important to the story because it really is what causes the flooding in a lot of the parts of Harrisburg. The water doesn't necessarily come in from the Susquehanna, but the Paxton Creek backs up, and that means that, that a lot of this part of, of the inland part of Harrisburg is going to be flooded, not so much from the water coming over the banks of the Susquehanna, but kind of coming in from behind as the Paxton Creek begins to overflow. Now, the, the reason that's an important fact is the fact that it would do no good for Harrisburg to build walls or dikes or anything to keep the water out. It would still come in from the Paxton Creek. So. Uh, it, it, it's a problem in terms of flood control, but it's also a blessing in disguise because we have a beautiful riverfront and some of the cities like, like Wilkes-Barre, uh, Sunbury and so forth have, have great big earthen walls and, and dikes and, and metal doors that open and shut when, the, when the, there's a threat of a flood and they don't see the river. So, uh, and here it shows what it looks like uh, today. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is, this is the Hack Campus, Harrisburg Area Community College. You can see that the entire campus is, is a sea of water. Uh, most of those buildings were only uh, a few years old when, when this was built. Uh, some of the buildings that have been added since that, Rose Lehrman Art Center was built just a year or two ago there. You go up about half a flight of stairs to get into the Rose Lehrman Art Center. Some of the other buildings, same thing. And that was for, for flood uh, protection that the, some of the buildings, that otherwise it's a flat campus, but they had to, they had to sort of artificially elevate uh, the ground level on that building. And I think the Hall Technology Center has the same thing. You go up a few steps to get into that. Here it is today. Okay, let's go to the next. Oh, the Patriot News. The Patriot News had to have, have the, the paper printed in Allentown for a couple of days because the plant was completely flooded. You can see the plant here flooded. Uh, they added a, a third floor, uh, I think, in the 1980s. Uh, I lived in Harrisburg, and that was added, but it was originally just a, a two-story building uh, there, right uh, in the industrial corridor, because in the old days, all of the, the big rolls of paper, rolls too big to fit in this room, came in by railroad, and the railroad tracks were right there. And the Patriot was there until, oh, maybe 15 years ago when they moved out uh, 81, and that's because everything's done by truck now, so rather than railroad. David, but, uh, and one of the few people who died in Harrisburg was the receptionist. That's the right. Patient. Yeah. Uh, what was the circumstance there, of, of I, I this? I forget her name, but we, uh, whenever you went in there, you, you'd recognize her. Yeah. Yeah. I just heard that story as well. Does anyone have the detail on that? That they were trying to rescue her, and she, she fell out of the boat or, yeah. or, or suffered a heart attack or something, but uh, she, she, she died in the process of being rescued from the Patriot News building. David. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. I found an article, I don't know if it was in this book about that. She was being rescued on a boat with a gentleman, and she was terrified of the water. Oh. And the boat shook, and whatever, they both plunged in. He uh, fortunately was safe, and they found her body uh, maybe half a block down. That's mm -hmm. in one of these. Oh, okay, great. Thank you for that. Yeah, this, this was part of the river, so this was moving water. It wasn't just standing water. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, Market Street looking west towards Cameron Street. So Cameron Street, you know, low-lying area, but as you go from, from downtown Harrisburg beyond the train tracks, it's all low-lying there until you reach uh, 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 the center city in the distance. There's bank building there, some of the other buildings downtown. Uh, you can see how flooded it was there in the vicinity of the railroad tracks. There you can see it today. Okay, next. Now this is a great photo showing uh, getting out boats to, to, to go and rescue people. Uh, and uh, this is on Market Street west of Cameron, the same general area. Uh, and here it is today. Some more of these buildings have been torn down. That's where the Patriot was. It's gone. I think the only thing left is this old bank. It was the Market Street Trust Company, and it's now the home of Pavone Advertising. But there's some redevelopment projects that, uh, that got started and then kind of got stalled. So we really don't know what's going to happen on the north side of Market Street 
uh, down in that old industrial area. But uh, uh, the water was deep all through here, and as you can see, it was. These are volunteers; they're not uniformed people doing this. So a lot of this was done by volunteers, including look like some younger people. Okay, you can and see slide. how fast the water is moving. Look at her feet in front. Yeah. But, yeah, That's right. The water's moving quickly. Okay. Catastrophe, debris, and cleanup. So after a couple of days of dealing with the high water, uh, this was the real difficulty. Uh, this is the fire I mentioned, the 2100 block away, this entire block of houses. Uh, save it. It was a huge conflagration because it was, you know, the gas lines and everything <coughs> started uh, igniting. Uh, today, there's, there's newer construction there. There's a couple of post-flood uh, row houses obscured by these trees, and this is sort of a one-story office building, I think, that was built in the 1980s, and it's elevated somewhat. Uh, it doesn't have its open ground floor, but they, they elevated it similar to the buildings at Hack. Next slide. The Walnut Street Bridge. The Walnut Street Bridge survived this flood, but not the ice flood of 1996, when it wiped out three spans of the, of the western side of the bridge. Uh, but, but look at all the debris that got caught in it. So that's so the water was, was up to the level of the, of the decking of the bridge, uh, if not above it. Uh, and that's quite high ground there. When you, when you go to the, the, the brow of, of, the, of the river bank there at Walnut Street, it's, it's really a great distance to get all the way down to the lower walkway. And then the steps go down 13 steps beyond that. So the, for the water to be up that high, that was pretty high. But you can see. This uh, eastern span uh, of the bridge survived intact. Uh, a number of years later, they used some of the recovery money that was intended to restore the western span, was used to reinforce the eastern span. Uh, they, they strengthened uh, all of the, the pillars that go down into the, into the, uh, the river bed uh, and actually made them go deeper into the river bed because they. Those, the original pillars were built on sand, and they said, you know, these pillars could just be washed away. Uh, but uh, so that, a lot of work was done to strengthen the eastern span. We still haven't given up hope that the western span might be restored someday, if not in its original appearance, in some fashion to, to serve as a, as a non-automobile crossing for the growing number of, of people that travel by bicycle, people that run and jog and, and have organized races, uh, and, and uh, just want to walk and get to City Island and get to the West Shore and rather than trying to squeeze all that onto the Market Street Bridge, which is what the current proposal is, which I think would just ruin the Market Street Bridge and not be uh, a satisfactory solution for anybody. So we're still fighting that battle. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Okay, <laughs> this would never be permitted today. This is Capona just a couple of months after uh, uh, the 72 flood. It, this is Labor Day weekend, and this catwalk, uh, there was always there was a catwalk that was added, so the sidewalk was actually outside of the bridge, uh, because the bridge was so narrow. It was built in the 1880s. They weren't, they had no idea what an automobile was in the 1880s, and so it was way too narrow, even for one lane in each direction, uh, certainly to also have a sidewalk within the, the structure of the bridge. So uh, as a safety feature, somewhere along the line, they added the, uh, these protruding uh, cantilevered catwalks uh, that, that you could use for pedestrians. But some of that got destroyed in the flood. You can see right in the foreground here that it, it's non-existent. And these places, the, this fencing is what captured all that debris. Here shows where, where parts of it were completely uh, washed away. Uh, and, and that was all taken away when they restored the bridge. But people are, are, <laughs> haven't been Pro prohibited from sitting out there, uh, which there'd be all kinds of yellow caution tape and everything in this day and age. Let's look at the next slide. Uh, clean up of the debris. Now, this is Hannah Street uh, in Harrisburg, and we've talked to people, some of our programs earlier in the month, some of the residents of Shipoke telling of what it was like to bring out all of this waterlogged furniture and mattresses and sofas and everything, and how it Badly, it smelled, and they said it smelled worse than sewage, and and uh, and it was a, a, a smell that they really couldn't describe. But they said you knew it once you once you noticed it. And it was just horrible. 
Uh, but people had to do that, and gradually the debris was taken away. Uh, here's some officials of some sort uh, uh, inspecting. But this is Hannah Street today, showing some of the new uh, post-flood architecture, some of the open garage designs that I mentioned earlier. Next slide. Am I blocking anybody's view? Great. And this is uh, uh, up in the 3500 block of River Alley behind uh, Front Street. And uh, uh, Jeb included this picture because that's Jeb Stewart as a teenager. <laughs> and he just put all the debris from his own grandparents' house uh, out of, in the alley to be hauled away. Uh, here's the alley today, uh, River Alley, halfway between Front Street there and Second Street over to there. Okay, next. Now this was amazing. Uh, the, the Mennonite women and other volunteers just showed up. Nobody made an arrangement. There wasn't some call that went out on the radio from the governor or anything like that. The Mennonite women simply showed up with buckets and, and mops to help clean out these houses in uptown Harrisburg and uh, uh, as volunteers, as volunteers, and here's the same stretch of, of Second Street today. They, they, uh, WITF, I think the radio station was brand new at that yes. point. And they were broadcasting, if you need help, or can give help, call so-and-so. So they were calling for volunteers. Okay, so WITF, which a new broadcaster at the time, was handling questions and, and referrals for people asking for volunteer help and so forth. I, I'm, I'm sure that wasn't what brought the Mennonites, because they don't have radios. But uh, uh, so, anyway, uh, people did help, and it was great. Okay, next. Hey, baby. Yeah. On the Mennonites. Along with that, there was one carpenter. Oh, yeah. Tell about that, Caleb. There was Caleb. a carpenter that came with them, a young carpenter, that seemed to open doors. He could do things nobody else could do. And the skull of button, I live in the 2700 block. The skull of button was, is this Christ visiting our flesh? <laughs> but we talked, and a young carpenter, and, did, and they just sort of disappeared. He was right behind these people. <laughs> but he, but open doors. So a lot of your doors don't open. You'd be surprised when you doors flood and swell up. They swell up and, and they stuck shut. Before. Yeah. And he just had a magic hand and he just oh. swept from house to house, fixing things that no one else seemed to get. Wow. I wow. like that. Nobody okay, else ever heard that story, but I thought I would. Thank you. Story. There were also a lot of students from Harrisburg. And I think the OIC organized them because they helped clean up our basement. Students. Uh, Great. Wonderful. Other other uh, memories of, of how people helped or got help? Um, I was up on July 4th that year and helped on Green Street. Oh, okay. I mean, it was 20 or 2100, but the lady that we talked to that we were going to go clean, she already had her house clean. <laughs> and uh, she said that, um, you know, she was just happy to talk to somebody <laughs> to tell and explain what had happened. So then we all went over to the Hurst Street Family Church, and that was where uh, we had set up from the giant store, or whatever that store was at, <coughs> on Cameron Street. Oh, okay. that, that store was flooded on Cameron Street. They had been out working, and we had like Ajax, for instance, or, or bottled stuff, uh, cleaning. And we had to go through the solution and take all the labels off, and cans, and food, and everything. And, um, Wow, so was that distributed? That was, uh, that was all clean with a, 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 some kind of sanitizer. I mean, we couldn't just hand out to people. Yeah. And so we had, evidently, uh, whenever we had enough to clean, then we could have people come in and get stuff. Wow. Wow, well, Martha, that's the fabulous. The American Red Cross, was, when we were, in, we were in Shaka, the Red Cross was phenomenal. They came right after they came, were allowed in, and they served us breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They didn't care if you're rich, poor, or what your situation was. They were they were there for how long? A long time. Gave us things, but I still had my bucket. Wow. <laughs> yeah. They were sturdy buckets. Wow. Great. Super. Yeah. My neighbor's aunt was in shy folks and he asked me to help and I did. Not only did the stink, but it was dark, there's no electricity. Yeah. It was a flashlight to get down the basement. It was a very scary situation being a teenager going out. I also helped at hack. I was a mailboy during seventy two. I helped clean that up too. That was no deal. Wow. Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> okay. I'll just add. Oh, go ahead, Ed. The, the Mennonite disaster group that Martha was sent to Green Street 
on. The following year, she came back to Green Street and bought the house where we still live. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's really safe. Okay. <laughs> Well, we're glad you guys live right here in the city. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, feel free to break in with other comments as we continue here, everybody. Vanished neighborhood. Now, this is the other thing. Uh, uh, any kind of a community that suffers widespread devastation, the first impulse is to just bulldoze everything and start over. And that, that has happened after earthquakes and other kinds of, of things. They just want to start over, or war, major wars. Uh, but uh, that's not exactly what happened in Harrisburg. Next slide, okay. Uh, in some places, entire neighborhoods disappeared. This is sort of South Shypoke, uh, south of the uh, I-83 area. Uh, and uh, Shypoke extended kind of all the way to Steelton in the old days. And, uh, and now there's the, the PennDOT building and, and a lot of open space down there. But they, they, they chose to, to eliminate all, all of that, partly because of the highway. Interstate 83 had gone through and, and already severed that part of Harrisburg, uh, but also the devastation and, and the condition of the, of, the, of the buildings. So that was one of the areas where they basically decided to, to bulldoze everything they could. And this is what it looks like today. Let's go to the next. Uh, close up of this South Knight Street uh, neighborhood. So this would be parallel to, to Cameron Street, uh, a, a block or so closer, a couple of blocks closer to the river, but parallel to Cameron Street going north and south. And old houses, they look like any other neighborhood in Harrisburg, uh, but uh, they're all gone today. Okay. The South 10th and, and Manada Street. Uh, again from I-83, this was a neighborhood, uh, and, uh, and there's nothing left. Revitalized neighborhood. Now, this, is, this is the good part of the story. Let's go to the next. Okay. Uh, a lot had to be demolished uh, in Shypoak, the corner of, of Nagel and Shower Streets looking south. Uh, after there was some demolition in this area, an entire block here was demolished, for example. Uh, and, uh, you know, the city was preparing to do more demolition. Urban renewal meant to get rid of it all and start over. And actually, it, it, was, it was kind of a grassroots effort that kind of fought back and got the city to think, eh, maybe these people are right. So. Uh, they, they wound up letting contracts for, for new blocks of flood-proof housing to be built in these same neighborhoods, and, uh, and, it's, and it's really amazing how successful it is today. This is the edge of the, the, the church that's there, the Peace Church, is it called, I think? Mm, so and and here, here's the Peace Church uh, in this picture. So, and that's a, turned into a beautiful residence. Uh, we, were, we were just down there uh, today on a bus tour. Let's go to the next. And this is interesting, showing how post-flood new construction uh, was designed and built. As I mentioned, the open garages on the first floor, and all you have on the ground level is a vestibule leading to your second floor. The balconies are the front porch on the second floor. You do all your outdoor living up there. Uh, and, uh, and this is what they look like today. And they blend in with a traditional neighborhood very nicely. Okay, next. Now this is great. Pancake Row was kind of in a forlorn condition before the flood. Uh, it, it, a lot of houses in Harrisburg kind of eventually became rooming houses, you know, where every, every bedroom was rented out to a different person. You had to lock the, the door. and I mean, these were rooming houses, and I think Bob and Eileen, you might know more about that, but I don't think Pancake Row was a desirable street uh, before the flood. No, I don't think they were rooming houses, though. No? Nope. But in fact, the second house... After uh, the flood, though. Yeah. Right. Or, or, yeah or individually resided in, but, uh, but they were... There, there wasn't the kind of desire to, to restore them to perfection as yeah. is done today. And, and Pancake Row, if you see it today, it, it, people love to stop and take pictures. It's beautiful. It's like San Francisco. And we and one of the things in the flood of 
1996, the wintertime flood in January, there was a fire and most of the, the interior uh, half of this row of, of eight houses burned to the ground because the fire department couldn't get in. And it's all been restored. And when you go look at it today, you can't see where the new construction starts and the old construction stops. It's, it's, it's a perfect uh, re recreation. Yeah. Excuse me. What you were saying about uh, borders, houses having borders, well, I lived on Hemlock, which uh, ran into 9th Street. So we, ha we knew people that lived on 9th Street. There were a lot of immigrants in that area, Polish, German, uh, Czech, whatever. And when they had family members or, or even friends of a family come over, they would rent them a room. So I knew one family that had a border. Uh, you know, he had his own bedroom with a you know, lock on the door and so on. And the family lived. Yeah. And then on Hemlock Street, uh, a widow, she took in borders in her place. Hmm. So there was that going okay. on. Okay. But not, not so much, I want to say, undesirable at that time, maybe there, because they were, you know, immigrants just looking for a place to live. But, uh, yeah, well, well I, I'm sure the they, were, they were good citizens. They, they weren't being, uh, you know, Bad for the neighborhood, but there, but there wasn't there wasn't the consciousness of, of of historic preservation that we have today. It was just you know keep the roof from leaking and, and get by and that kind of thing. Make sure everybody stays out of trouble uh, and so forth. And that was you know that was life in a in a blue collar neighborhood. You were okay, saying let's go. You were saying the about the, the firemen. Actually, they did get in there. Uh, somebody at Pensy Supply got a, a, a backhoe in there and plowed this, the ice away. They pulled the fire trucks in there and the, the one house, Shirley Blau, who's not here, I think. Marks. Shirley Marks now. Uh, they stopped it in her, on standing on her bed and watering. Wow. So the firemen did get there, but... but From being more widespread. They did eventually. But a, yeah. there's a couple of those houses. Great. Okay. Let's go to the next. North Front Street buildings lost and preserved. Now, Front Street, as you know, that's that's our that's the signature streetscape of Harrisburg, one of the most beautiful streetscapes in all of the United States, in my opinion. And uh, and historic Harrisburg has worked from the very beginning to try and, and keep Front Street in a, in its in its most beautiful appearance, even knowing that many <coughs> of the buildings have been changed from residential to commercial and office use and so forth. So let's take a look at Front Street. Here was the Dowtrick residence. The Dowtrick family had, had other businesses, but this was a big house uh, at Front and Kelly. It didn't survive. Uh, this Here's a flood-proof office building on that location today. You can see these archways. There's covered parking and, a, and an elevator vestibule going up to the second, third, and fourth floor. Let's go to the next. Now this is a great shot. This, this shows the flood. This is the building uh, at uh, See, is, is that the front and Kelker? And that's the Kel Front building, I think it's called. And now that it's a, a very modern two story building. Uh, and, uh, uh, but this was the Stackpole Mansion. It's, it was here, it's gone. And this is the Tracy Mansion, which became Charles Tracy Mansion at the corner of whatever the next, what's the next street? Minute. Minute. Okay, good. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so the Tracy Mansion survived, but there's a little more to that story coming up. But here you can see this is the parking lot next to, next to Tracy Mansion is where the Stackpole Mansion disappeared. Look at that beautiful mansion right there. It, it didn't make it. Okay, next. Now here's a story about the Tracy Mansion. After the flood and flood recovery, uh, the, the threat of urban renewal was, was still a threat throughout Harrisburg that, that any building that, that, that wasn't immediately being brought back to life by its owners, uh, the, 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 the redevelopment authority would target for, well, let's tear it down and, and, and build something new there. Uh, Historic Harrisburg fought it. This is an early edition of our uh, newsletter. Uh, and uh, Historic Harrisburg, that was one of the very first battles that Historic Harrisburg won. You might remember that. Bob and Eileen, were you involved? Probably you were president back then, Bob. Jeb remembers it very well, because I know he was active. I think he wrote the story. So, okay, let's go to the next slide. 
<laughs> and this is a house on North Front Street that happens to be <coughs> Jeb Stewart's grandmother's house, and here they're hosing it out. This, this oriental carpet that went back in, that had to be sent to Esses and Chuns and hung vertically for a year and a half to dry out, and then they brought it back. Okay, next slide. Aftermath. Okay, the establishment by the Harrisburg Redevelopment Authority of the Cameron South Harrisburg Urban Renewal Area uh, and the Penn Susquehanna Urban Renewal Area. So tear it down and start over. But what really happened was it was an amazing about face and a compromise where uh, uh, mixing, preserving the old buildings and adding infill of new construction uh, was very successfully carried out in both areas. So let's uh, move forward. Uh, the founding of historic Harris Harrisburg, what, what happened was that they needed to organize. If they were going to effectively uh, approach City Hall and say you need a different uh, uh, strategy for revitalize, revitalizing our neighborhoods, uh, that uh, they needed to speak with a unified voice. The Shypoke Neighborhood Association came into being, the Midtown Action Council came into being, Historic Harrisburg came into being uh, about six months after the flood in, September, in uh, um, February of 1973. So that was the idea that we really can be much more effective if we have an organization and speak with one voice, have officers and committees and so forth. So that really was, was uh, a key part of it. And that led to the formation of historic districts. Harrisburg now has 11 historic districts. Some are municipal districts that the Architectural Review Board is in charge of, and others are uh, National Register Historic Districts, which are approved by the federal government. Okay, let's go continue here. Maybe that's it. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you all very much. Ooh, well done. Well done. <laughs> any, other, any other comments or questions, anybody? Yes. I found in the book the story about Patriot News, what happened. Oh, good. Is it okay if I read it a little? Go ahead. Okay. Thursday evening, June 22nd, the conditions had deteriorated considerably on Market Street. At the Pink Creek News offices, blood waters reached up to the first floor window. Against her better judgment, Emma Parker, okay, she's not pictured, an operator working in the newspaper for 30 years, climbed into a river rescue boat along with reporter Clyde Chu. Her intense fear of the boat, along with the rushing floodwaters, undoubtedly contributed toward the capsizing of the boat. She, along with the others, fell into the raging floodwaters. Several days later, her body was found a short distance downstream. Shu, uh, Clyde Shu, was carried by the current across Market Street up to the parking lot of the post office building, where he managed to cling to the axle of a truck until Harrisburg River Rescue could return a rescue Thank you. That's wow. book. Yeah, that's a great book. It's uh, yeah, I, I got this at, uh, Eric CBS. Basic, and you can get that at the, yes. at the Dauphin County Historical Society or at Midtown Scholar or other places. Eventually, we're going to have a, a bookshop here in our building. You'll be able to get a lot of that stuff here. I want to mention just again that this program, which, which, which tells it this is the final uh, activity of the season of events, we had a wonderful committee of, of neighbors from Shypoak and from Midtown, as well as some historic Harrisburg volunteers who met starting a year ago to plan all of this, knowing that the Agnes anniversary was coming up. We've done 40th anniversary and 45th anniversary, but for the 50th, they really wanted to do something significant. So uh, putting in the marker down there, there's still hope of getting some kind of a mural on one of the bridge abutments uh, right at the north end of Chai Oak. But that's, you know, that's a, a $10,000 proposition and a lot of permission and so forth, but we had a wonderful, there was a, a picnic and a community celebration, Shy Poke was featured on the, on the garden tour uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, bit, a big turnout for Third in the Berg uh, in the other room out there, uh, and then this program tonight, as well as a lot of stuff in the news media. We, we were interviewed by, by television stations, by print media. Um, uh, I was on uh, Radio Smart Talk with Julie Iaria, uh, whose family was, was, was rescued by boat from their house in Shypoke. She did a great job when we did that. And it's still on WITF.org if you want to listen to it. Uh, but, uh, but a lot of was done to 
commemorate and, and capture stories, because a lot of these people, you know, they're, they're not going to be around forever. So we really got a lot, of, a lot of good eyewitness involvement from people, and also to pass on the stories to the, to the new, newcomers that have moved in, and they're really taking their place as far as becoming community leaders. Uh, a great young, very energetic uh, president of the Shypoke Neighborhood Association, Rebecca Leaphart. She is just remarkable in what she gets done. Uh, she was probably in, in, in kindergarten when, when the flood came through. So, but, uh, but she's uh, maybe not even born, actually. Uh, but anyway, so, so a lot has been done. I also want to call your attention to our updated calendar of events. We've rescheduled a number of things, so be careful. Uh, a couple of the things upcoming that you might be interested in. Uh, we have a walking tour on August 6th. Uh, and that's going to be about the, the, the city beautiful revisited. Uh, we start and end at the, at the Capitol Fountain. Uh, and then we're going to have a bus tour September, Saturday, September 17th. <laughs> Later, Beth. <laughs> uh, we're going to be on Gallery Walk uh, on Sunday, September 11th. Uh, and uh, we're, oh, we're going to be on the Jazz Walk uh, on the Friday before Gallery Walk. And uh, we're going to have Steve Rudolph here, so you'll hear more about that as we get uh, start cranking out our publicity. I want to thank, uh, by the way, Ashley Christ is our communications director, running tonight's program for us, not only for you, but for the viewers at home. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Thank you. And if, if you read our, our printed communications or our online uh, Harris, historic Harrisburg happenings that comes out every two weeks or our Facebook and everything. Ashley coordinates all of that and we really feel that uh, we, the way we uh, gather an audience is because of good communication. So with that, a quick question. We, I want to know whether you, you found out or came to this because of something you got in print or something you got uh, through social media or uh, the, the commercial news, because we, we advertised in, in uh, the Berg and places like that. So I'm going to limit it to those three categories, and maybe you saw it in all three, but, but, but raise your hand for what you think was the dominant uh, means of finding out about tonight, because that'll help us in the future. So uh, uh, printed communication from historic Harrisburg. Okay. And then electronic communication from historic Harrisburg. Well, okay. Uh, and, and something in the commercial news media. Well, okay, so that was worth our while. Great, thank you, good. Well, thank you all very much for coming. You're a great audience. Uh, on the, the fourth Monday in August, uh, in two months, our next fourth Monday program is gonna be at the State Museums, not here at the State Museum, a behind the scenes look at that mid-century modern architectural masterpiece being led by the two ladies that really are responsible for making it a mid-century modern landmark and not letting it be uh, uh, inappropriately updated and so forth. It's a, it's, they like to say it's a museum of a museum, but it really is a great museum, and you're going to see some great things if you come on the 22nd of, of August over there, not here. Uh, so with that, please join us back in the Bankers Hall to look further at the exhibit uh, or to have refreshments if you like. Uh, linger as long as you like, but thank you again. Thank you very much for coming.